Hey, it's your pal Mike Shea from Sly Flourish, and I am here today with John Four from Role Playing Tips. And we are doing a series of videos, uh, four videos, where we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of interesting things in relation to generating stories for D&D. Today's video, we're going to be talking specifically about building situations and the five-room dungeon, and how you can use these two concepts together, uh, mash them together, and add them into your toolkit to tell, to tell awesome stories during your role-playing game. As I mentioned, this is one of four videos we're going to do. Part two of this video series is going to be on physical dungeon design, and will be available by subscribing to both my newsletter and John four's newsletter where there is a url for how to do so down in the show notes for this video part three is going to be on heists and capers and will be available for patrons of sly flourish if you go down you will see the link to patreon.com slash sly flourish and part four is going to be specifically on mysteries and how to run mysteries and that video will be available on john four's patron at patreon.com slash John4. The link for that is also down below. So our goal for this video and really all, all of the videos you'll find in this series is to bring ideas to you that you can add to your toolkit to help you tell stories and help you share stories in your RPGs. And, and like I said, today we're gonna to be talking specifically about building situations and the five room dungeon. John, do you wanna, do you wanna start by describing what we're talking about when we're talking about five room dungeons? Yeah, thanks. So five room dungeons, um, they're, they're a, basically a hack or a tool uh, that's really flexible. I invented them in 2003 and then it's kind of taken off and I think they're, it's a testament to their usefulness. So they're basically a model or a template on how to build adventures, on how to structure your adventures. And uh, they're a useful scaffold to make, uh, you can use them for one shots or you can use them like Legos to build larger adventures with. And uh, there, so what, what happened was I, I'm a big fan of Joseph Campbell, uh, who is an academic who researched a whole bunch of cultures, uh, historical cultures, and then realized that there were patterns in their storytelling, uh, in their storytelling cult, uh, culture, their storytelling histories. Uh, Vladimir Prop actually is another person to check out. He did the Russian version of, uh, of that. Anyway, so, but his uh, hero's journey, which is this multi-step kind of story framework that Hollywood uses, on every movie almost, um, I realized could be condensed uh, for our medium into five five core steps. And so each of those steps I call a room. And so uh, just a, like a at the time I called and I published it, it's a five room dungeon, but a, a, like a, probably a more better way to look at it is a five room adventure. We're not talking purely dungeons. It's you can use it for any kind of adventure, but five room dungeons is the name that stuck. And so, so each of the rooms has a key um, purpose in the story. And we'll go through the five rooms right now so you have uh, an overview of what they're about. So the first room is entrance or guardian. So any story has to have a beginning. And so this room is about introducing the story. It's about letting the players know they're entering a new adventure. They're not in the normal world anymore. And room two is puzzle or role playing. So that takes advantage of our, of our hobby, which is role playing. They are in RPGs. And, uh, it's about introducing the players to um, what the adventure is about. It's like a guide moment, or it is an orientation or a vector moment. So the puzzle and role-playing um, encounters, getting them further into your storyline and uh, directing them so that the, you have a greater chance of triggering you know, rooms three through five. The third room is trick or setback. So without conflict, the stories are boring. Like you, uh, the best rewards are ones that you've earned, like you feel like you've struggled and you've overcome and you've learned things. And so that is rewarding. That's what makes rewards uh, valuable. And so room three is about introducing some kind of challenge that could potentially uh, set back the party or uh, some kind of trick, uh, trap or, or something that you can do to the, the players to kind of catch them and introduce an obstacle. And in, in the world of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, that kind of a game, which is a resource depletion game at some level, room three is about uh, depleting their resources a bit so that they're not uh, at 100% before they reach uh, room four, uh, which is about the final conflict or the, the climax of your adventure. So this is the, the big conflict with the villain, the stage boss, uh, the, the giant comet that is about to uh, hit Earth. And um, so that is where your adventure is won or lost, where the characters uh, confront and decide and, and figure out if they're, they're going to be victorious or if something uh, terrible is going to happen after all. And then uh, finally, we have the denouement or the, the reward section, uh, room five, which is about um, 
it, it's about delivering the, the the characters reap the rewards of their actions. So if they're successful, then they get treasure and they get um, clues to the next adventure and whatnot. But it's also about, uh, from a strategic perspective, revelation and plot twists. So we don't want, in general, unless you're running a one shot in a campaign, you want the five room dungeon to lead to the next five room dungeon or to the next uh, stage of your adventure. And so room five is not only about giving a reward, but staging the next adventure, hooking it. And so that is about generally a, a revelation, like, okay, you've solved this thing, but did you know this thing is now happening or the next layer of the onion? So if you combine all five of those rooms, you have a complete standalone story. And it's a really powerful model because it's simple. You can keep it in your mind and you can structure your adventure as big or small uh, that way. So that's the, that's uh, the nutshell of five room dungeons. And uh, they work very well with situations. So I think uh, I think that's your expertise, uh, Mike, on, on situations. Yeah, I don't know if I go so far as expertise, but it's certainly a, a, a direction that I've been heading and something that I've been thinking about a lot. So yeah, the the and I think what's really interesting we're going to talk about in a bit is combining these ideas. And while you're talking, I'm thinking about that a lot. Uh, so the idea behind like what is situation based adventure design, and to me. Uh, Situation-based adventure design is when you focus on what situation is occurring in the world independent of the characters. So generally speaking, you have like a location, you have a, a, a big area, you have a bunch of people that are in that area, you have the things that they're doing, and you have some kind of goal, right? You have some kind of something that the characters need to accomplish in that area. And you sort of set the situation that's where you prepare, right? That, that's where you spend your time is figuring out what's the location like, what are the inhabitants like, what are their motivations while they're moving around, and, and then, you know, where's the prize, whatever the prize happens to be. How, and then think about how that works on its own, right? Think about how it, how it works. If the characters never showed up, what would be going on there, right? It's unlikely the boss would be sitting in a throne with his five bodyguards waiting for somebody to show up. It's more likely, yeah. you know, he might be moving around, right? And then, and then you release the characters into it. Right. And you see what they do and you, 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 you describe options. The characters can learn things about the situation. They can sort of do recon or they can interrogate people or maybe they already know it because they've been there before. Then the players are deciding how they're going to approach it and what they're going to do. So if you want to break down a situation into the steps that you that you put together for, for actually getting one together, you either draw or select a map for the location. Right. It's very location based. Typically, when I when I run a situation, it's very you know, it's what others would refer to as like a location-based adventure. You go somewhere and you do something. So you, you need a map. Uh, I'm a big fan of stealing maps or finding them on the internet and, and then building my adventures around those maps rather than making my own maps. But that's not for everybody. I'm, I'm particularly lazy. It could be anything. It could be a dungeon. It could be a fort. It could be a manor. It could be a keep. You know, any, and it could be a sewer system. It could be a, a thieves guild. It could be a dragon's lair. Whatever it is, you find a map. You set that. Then you say, okay, who, who, who's there? Right? Who are the individuals? What what groups? And it might be multiple groups. So I always like to use the the hobgoblin fortress as an example. And you might have a hobgoblin fortress that's sitting on a ruin, right? And they've built up the ruin and fortified it as their fort. But it was an old keep before, and it has tunnels underneath, and there's undead in the tunnels, right? And the hobgoblins know not to go down there. But that offers multiple options for the characters to go if they want to go in through the tunnels and fight undead or they want to go on top and fight hobgoblins. So you might have multiple inhabitants that might not even like each other that are in this location. You decide on their behavior. What do they do? It's a lot more likely undead are just hanging out, you know, hating their existence, right? But hobgoblins are probably doing stuff. They're doing drills or they're going on missions or they're sleeping or they're gambling or whatever they're doing. So you want to decide what they're doing. And that kind of gives you that idea of what the situation is. And then you have the goal, right? If the goal is we need to cut off the head of the serpent and kill the hobgoblin warlord, or it could be we need to find out what the hobgoblin warlord is up to and steal steal their plans. That is a goal that you might that you might, and you have to continually reinforce the goal during the plan because it's easy for players to lose track of the goal. They're like, "Why are we doing this?" And sometimes they'll lose it halfway through. They're in the tunnels, and they're like, "Why are we here again?" All right? And you got like, "Oh, you know." If, as you recall, your goal is to get rid of the. Oh, that's right. Or they go into hobo mode all the time, right? All right. Just like combat. Yeah. Yeah, we just like combat, so we're gonna fight. And like, oh, and sometimes they're like, we don't actually have to fight everything. Like, all we need to do is listen at the door and hear the plan and get and, and get out, right? One of the things that so so once you sort of prepared the location, one of the other things during play is what and I I I guess I overuse the term turning the dials, but you have control over what the actual situation is while the characters are there. And during the game, you can decide, is it appropriate for them to run into a room with two drunken hobgoblins that are half asleep? Or is it more appropriate that they walk into 20 hobgoblins working on their phalanx drills? 
right? And and that's sort of the beats and pace of the game. If it's if they've had an easy time of it, and you think it's time for a, a big knockdown drag out fight, then you know, 20 hobgoblins working on their phalanx maneuvers uh, is more likely than the two drunken ones. But if they've been having a hard time, the roles haven't been going well, they're feeling down, well, maybe walking in on two drunken hobgoblins is exactly the right pace for the job. So you can sort of shift the, you know, you can play the shell game with the different kinds of things that that that, that take place there. So the the advantage of, of sort of situation-based D&D is as a GM, you don't even know what's going to happen. You're set the situation and you tell the players what's going on. They decide how they're going to go, and then you adjudicate. Which is really the, that's that's the core mechanic of D and D, right? Is DM describes the situation, players describe what they want to do, DM adjudicates the results. We're just doing it at an adventure wide scale, you know, or maybe in a multi session scale, depending on, on nice. how things go. You and I have talked before, and and uh, you know, you, I, I'm familiar with the five room dungeon technique, and you've heard me talk about situations. So how do we take these two ideas and sort of bring them together into something new? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, good question. So, you know, I, I like the situations thing because I just actually got an email uh, from uh, from a patron today, and they asked, "Well, my players are always breaking my stories, and, um, and your advice is you <laughs> don't you have situa- one." <laughs> <laughs> That's right, exactly. You create situations, not outcomes. Like I've I've read your advice on that several times, and that's that's solid. So, um, creating a situation means almost like creating a simulation. So you're understanding uh, what it is that the the, the entire uh, environment uh, as a as a like a machine, and then as the players do anything they want, unexpected or not, um, you're able to to react because you understand the machine. You can have the the machine react to it. So uh, that is that is fantastic. It gives you flexibility. It's not going to paint you in the corners. So basically, how five room dungeons can meet uh, situations is that five room dungeons are these these almost like Legos. So when you're talking about situations, you don't have to. Like one challenge, if you have a larger environment, is how do, how do I you know, wrap my head around in the middle of a game the entire environment? How's the entire environment going to react? Or another way to think of it is um, a larger environment is a larger list of options that I need to keep in mind to figure out how I will react or adjust the pacing, the beats, or whatever my decisions are in the game. And so five room dungeons can help you chunk that down. So if you turn your five room dungeons or sorry, if you turn your your situation or your your location into a series of five room dungeons or Legos, then you actually have smaller pieces. Like you can just think, okay, how do my individual five room dungeons react to uh, the situation, to the characters as they they meet with the situation? So let like just a random like let's say my adventure has a hundred encounters, then um, I'm not thinking about okay, how do um, hundred or ninety nine encounters react to this one encounter? Right. <laughs> I can Oh yeah, how do how do my uh, twenty pieces of Lego react uh, to this one instead of having to you know grapple with it all at once? Yeah, I've been I've been thinking about I've been thinking about the idea as the the five room dungeon is like a snake, right? You've got these five oh, pieces yeah. that are interwoven with like like knots in a in a string, and if I look at my situation, there are not unlimited routes, but you know many more routes than as a GM I can keep in my head. But when I, as soon as I hear the characters, as soon as I hear the players start to make a choice, I take that string and I move that string over to wherever, whatever choice they made. Right? Nice. So I, yeah. I can still use those five knots, but now yeah. those knots have moved to a different part of the dungeon depending on what path they take. And, yes. and that idea of probably the, the final, my, my final, like how do you run a situation, th- that's probably where the five room technique drops in the best is if I know what those five, those five beats are those five things that are going to make an enjoyable story. I can move those into the position in my situation because yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, whenever I'm running a situation, I have no idea what's happening on the other side. Like unless it's the boss, right? Unless I know they're going to go there. I don't, I don't think about it. I only worry about what's in front of the characters and what's maybe one room out, you know, yeah. at any given point, but I can use those five rooms to help me outline you know, outline that, yeah. that, that, those arcs. And that's really cool. Cause I never thought of the five rooms as beats. Um, I'm going to go away and noodle on that. Um, uh, cause that's exactly what they are. Just to give reference to beats that the concept of beats is not some sly flourish magic. This is, uh, Robin Laws, uh, a, a long time, uh, uh, game, game designer for RPGs of all different sorts has written a book called Hamlet's hit points, which talk about the beats of, of stories and movies, and then how we bring those beats over to D and D 
or, or over to our RPGs. And it's got a whole lot of different stuff in it. But the main concept of the book is that you have this idea of upward and downward beats. And you generally want to be oscillating between upward and downward beats, the same way you were talking about. You want to have, you know, you want to have a, 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 a challenge or setback before you have your big boss fight. You want a downbeat and then an upbeat. Because too many upbeats and people get bored, right? It's too easy. Yeah. Or it's too easy or it's just not that exciting. Too many downbeats and they're just depressed and they hate and they want to go home. So you, yeah. you have to continually have these like upward beats and downward beats. And I, in, in my opinion, those are things you need to be able to improvise. You, know, you can plan them to a point, but you're going to have to improvise them a lot because you don't know what path the characters are going to take and you still want to make sure to have those beats. I, another thing is if, if it's constantly, if the tension is constantly increasing, so beats being tension and uh, lack of tension, then I've heard feedback that my players just get burned out. Like by the yeah. end, by the time you get to the ex most exciting counter, the encounter that you know you you're 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 looking forward to just finally meeting the villain or the stage boss or the you know the the giant lava pit with the cultists and the and the ritual. Yeah. Then if everybody's burned out and wiped out, no energy left in the room because okay. you haven't had that oscillating tension release, then uh, you're you it's going to be a, a it's not going to be as good of an experience for sure. Right. And I like the that snake or string approach because. That's exactly how I think of it. So GMs are often trying to think a couple of steps ahead, but what they're trying to do is engineer an outcome. So I need them to win this battle so that my other things set that I've set up to be this way, just this way will work. But instead, if you're looking at it through that kind of improvisational snake, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Then yeah, what, so let, let's be, let me get uh, specific with the five room dungeon. So five room dungeon has an entrance. So as soon as your situation triggers, you're kind of in the entrance. But it doesn't matter how or where they trigger that situation. So they could go through any of the possible entrances, which we'll talk about in the in the next video, multiple paths and entrances. It doesn't matter which one they choose. You've now triggered that first room. And then it doesn't matter you know, where they're going through your, your adventure or your dungeon. The next encounter that you can be thinking about and trying to queue up is going to be about that role playing or puzzle that slash kind of guide, that build momentum uh, moment to keep them uh, hooked. It's almost like you're going to layer the five room dungeon on top of your situation. And you're going to think, okay, they've just finished the entrance. It could be some guards or something. And now they're going to, whatever they're going to do next, I'm going to try to add some role play into it. I don't have to force a pure role playing encounter. It can be another combat encounter if they go left into the, into the phalanx uh, hobgoblins encounter instead of, the guys playing uh, the goblins playing cards but you're going to think about okay well how can i add a role playing element to continue the adventure along to hook them and uh and to you know follow the story structure so the role playing is quite often a, a bit of a lower beat now that i'm kind of processing it <laughs> and so yeah so now i'm thinking how can i overlay a little bit of a role playing element onto doesn't matter what encounter occurs so that's the improv but improvisation is quite often scary there's no safety net but now the five room dungeon gives you that. It gives you the structure. You're thinking ahead. Okay, now I'm thinking next next knot in the rope. That should be role playing if I can wrangle it. I mean, if you don't, it's not the end of the world. This is just a guide. But yeah, so that's really good. A classic encounter that foils GMs is you, maybe you have a mystery. And so in that mystery, the characters encounter guards. And so what often happens is they murder hobo the guards. And now the, eight, the players ultimately have reduced agency because they're wanted. Uh, by the the authorities they're they're being hunted and so that means they no longer can move as freely as they could they're always having to look over their shoulders or there's guards now at different spots that are blocking uh location or the spots of clues and things like you know just the logical development of such a situation as okay we're going to break the law and then whack some guards in the process <laughs> how can we how can we uh, use the five room dungeon with this situation to improvise and see how the how things turn out and possibly guide things back and course correct so the the second encounter so the first encounter the entrance the guardian is okay they encounter some guards they challenge them and then uh, you know all right why did you guys suddenly attack and, and whack them that's terrible okay now we're on to the next encounter a five room dungeon applied to the encounter with guards that looks like it's going to go left on you left at albuquerque and it's going to be like murder hobo and now you face this problem of okay i, I don't want a, a wanted campaign a hunted campaign so what can i do in this combat by applying the five room dungeon story model onto it to kind of fix this situation and improvise so the first room combat starts roll initiative you sigh heavily and move on second room uh what you would do is the the lead guard so this is a role-playing thing so you're thinking okay well what's a role-playing moment here that i could use to apply the situation to fix the situation 
So the lead guard might uh, try to parley with the players and say, look, we don't, we don't want any problems here. Like, like, let's talk this out. Like you give the characters an out at this point. They're, they're not committed. Like there hasn't been um, so much that there's no point of return. So then let's say it continues. Well, in, in room three, which is setback or trick, you might have reinforcements arrive. So, uh, you know, in between second 13 to 18, uh, nearby guards off duty or nearby patrol or however you want, you want to conjure it. Now there's overwhelming odds against the characters and the players. And they might second guess themselves saying, okay, is this actually worth it? Now there's like 20 guards and we can see more on the horizon and uh, they're blowing whistles. There could be a hundred here in a, in a few minutes. So, you know, is this the right course of action? Should we stop uh, or not? I mean, maybe you want to embrace it, but anyways, you're using the story structure uh, to kind of think about what you're going to do uh, in each room and then in each round as well. And then in room four, is the battle royale so it's a, it could be a standoff you're trying to think okay this is the major conflict what is the major conflict that i i wanted to kind of produce in this uh in this combat in round four and so then you would say okay overwhelming odds uh, you might even switch to mass battle con uh, uh rules or whatnot <laughs> but anyways you're just saying there's so many guards here are you really going to try to whack all of them and then finally in room five you have the outcome. So again, we're not directing uh, actions. We're not creating these brittle plot lines where players must do things on, on railroad tracks. So you just let gameplay happen. You're finding out what happens next through gameplay. So that would be room five outcomes. And so then you might think, okay, well, there's possible outcomes here. So I, I have a few options. One might be, all right, the players become hunted. So that becomes your, your gameplay moving forward until they can fix it. Maybe they get a good lawyer. So <laughs> also the, the, the players might gain an ally. So maybe you turn it around so the guards actually become on the player's side so that you could think about the outcomes in, in round two because you understand the five-room dungeon. You can think a couple of steps ahead. The parley could be about, okay, let's, instead of attacking each other, let's form an alliance. You guys are just trying to solve a mystery. We're trying to solve it too. Hey, we'll give you all the credit. We just want to save our lives, whatever the case may be. Uh, or you could be, um, maybe the guards are corrupt. And so they make them bribable. Or in round five, um, it, it, so you might think in, in round four, the, the, the battle Royale is happening. You might say, look, we don't, we don't all want to perish here. Let's just like for, for that bag of gold you've got on your hip, we'll stop. We'll go look at the other direction. You move on and we'll just, you know, uh, we'll frame the, your rivals for the, for the thing, whatever, you know, you can think of, uh, or it's, um, maybe, uh, like as a twist, which is another function of room five is uh, the villain has set this entire encounter up. He sent the guards to confront the PCs, knowing the PCs would murder Hobo. <laughs> and then you have this revelation in the middle of the combat that the villain is pulling the strings here, and the players won't like that. So then they'll back off and, and from the, yeah, from the, the combat, the, perhaps. Or the the, the whole, uh, uh, you know, well, we came here to stop the dragon. You're like, fools, I sent the dragon three days ago. Right. <laughs> 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 exactly. That's awesome. So... The idea, to your point, is we're not creating outcomes. We're creating situations. If we layer some kind of story framework onto the situations, you always have a guide. You always have a, a friend in the back of your mind coaching you as to how to kind of proceed through things with an improvised kind of a game where you're not you know, forcing the players to a certain outcome. So I think the five-room dungeon model could really help GMs as they run their situations, both as you know, the, the Lego pieces, how does everything react? And then also in a, in a single encounter, you can use story structure to kind of plot things out that way and hopefully gain the outcome that you're looking for, but you're not purposefully engineering and forces, force their choices. So I think that's, that's a good approach. Uh, situations are kind of like uh, improvisation meets a simulation. So if you have the, the hobgoblin fortress, you're not dictating ahead what every encounter is. You're going to let the gameplay decide which counters players choose and how those encounters turn out. But improvisation is scary. So you can use the five-room dungeon model, kind of structure your thinking, plan a couple of steps ahead, and know that the five-room dungeon itself is a full storyline. It is a self-contained full storyline from beginning through the middle of a story to the end of the story. So by following that, then you're going to actually, even if you just do one room at a time, it, metaphorically, you're still you're going to guaranteed have a fantastic story come out of it because you're following basically mythical story structure that humans have developed over the years and were distilled by Joseph Campbell and Vladimir Prop. <laughs> so I like that uh, situations 
help you think holistically about the uh, entire place. So it doesn't feel like you, you get a lot of wins out of that and you get a lot of you know, like consistency theme and, uh, and kind of like an organism reacting in a believable way. And that is also a tool to help you kind of improvise and think through things better. And then the five room dungeon model helps you wrap your head around complex situations better, whether you break your situations up into Legos or on an encounter by encounter basis, you're following some good story structure. Ultimately, like no plan survives contact with the players. <laughs> and so situations mean that you can stay flexible and your, 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 your mind doesn't explode. Your adventure doesn't break because you don't have a pre-plotted adventure. And then the five room dungeons help you guide along that, guide you along that path. In our next video in, a, in, our, in our series here, uh, we're going to talk about how to build fantastic dungeons. And so that's exciting. You're going to teach me some stuff there. I'm looking forward to it. So I hope to see everyone who's watching this there. Yeah. So if you want to see the next video, in the show notes below will be a link to subscribe to both my newsletter and John Four's newsletter for role-playing tips, mine for Sly Flourish. And when you join both newsletters, you, you, you know, only have to enter your information once. But when you enter in your, in your information, you will get the link to the next video and uh, be able to see that. And then for videos three and four, uh, subscribe to my, Patre my Patreon at patreon.com slash Sly Flourish. And John Four's Patreon at patreon.com slash John Four. Links for that are down below as well. Say that 10 times fast. No, I think I'll just do it the <laughs> once. <laughs> All right. Thank all right, you all very much. And we'll see you in the next video.